based on the introduction. So as has been said, so this, this talk won't be specifically for networks, hence I put graphs in the title. So it'd be a bit different to what you heard in the beginning of the afternoon, because even math in the slides. So I hope that this will not scare you too much. I will try to stay quite high level so that you can relate things. So the idea really is that, is really that, that you will be able to come home with like some, uh, a message on how we can do machine learning on structured data. So when we talk about network, in my case, I don't only think about telecommunication network, right? So a communication network, that's one type of network, but like flight routes that connects cities around the world, that's also another network, right? The nodes of the cities, which are linked by uh, air carriers. I can also see the roads as a network, right? It also defines a, a, a communication networks across cities or across uh, parts of the country. As the hyperlink, the internet itself is a big network. Pages will be the nodes, and hyperlinks are a way to navigate across those pages. I can also see a protein as a, as a network itself, or like interactions between proteins, or interactions between any kind of objects, actually. The objects are the nodes, and the kind of interactions they form, like if they work together, they will be connected. Same for social network, right? I can have data about the users, but also have a kind of relations among them. So the motivations for this talk is that in, in a traditional machine learning, what you are doing is you give the machine a set of features. Let's say uh, for each user, you tell him the age, where he lives, the profession, how much he earns, and the machine says, give him credit, don't give credit. Simple, right? What you want to do here is that you want to use those features, so information about the nodes, information about the objects, but also you want to exploit the structure among the objects. So we not only want to use the age, the profession, the earnings, but you also want to use information about your friends. Who are you connected to? And let's say like, imagine on, this, on Facebook, if I know just your friend, I know your 100 friends on Facebook, just looking at the data on them, I can predict a lot of things about you. And just the age, just take the average age of your friends on Facebook, I'm sure it's a pretty good predictor of your age uh, of yourself. So the, the idea is that I will not, not only use information from myself, but also information about the other objects that I'm connected to, wherever this information comes from. So, we, so what we will speak about, so what, that's one example here. So I take a graph that's a protein, nodes are atoms, and links are interaction between those atoms. You don't really need to know what that means, but we have information about the atoms, like maybe the electric charge, the, the atomic number, maybe some other feature, characteristics, and we have these interactions. And then we want to predict something. Maybe classification, that's a toxic protein, that's a non-toxic one. Maybe it's a regression, you want to say, okay, 80% toxic, so better not inject that in the body. So the tasks then are the same as in classical machine learning. <clears throat> so yeah, that's mostly what I said, right? We want to integrate structure and features in a coherent machine learning algorithm. So how do we do that? Like one would be an extrinsic, what I call an extrinsic way. Let's say I will extract information from the network and use that as additional features. So take again our social network example. I have the features as the age, revenue, location in the world. Maybe I can use information about the connections, like the number of friends. That's a very simple feature I can extract from a network, right? Just connecting, the, just counting the number of edges that emanates from the node. That's a simple one. There are more involved ones, like modularity or some centrality measures that you can compute from the networks, and that will just give you another set of features that extends your original features, and then you will use any learning algorithm you want. Deep learning, SVM, what have you. Fit that in significant. Here we mostly take a more intrinsic way. So we really like try to use the network or the graph as a support for computation. So we only really extract information from this network, but we really like use it as a support. So now I will just we go through one method to do that. Obviously that's the method that I developed two years ago. Now there's been a lot of other methods, so there's not only one way to do that. There's many of them. They each have advantages and disadvantages. Won't have time to speak about that. So I just want to show you one way of doing it. So we start from those convolutional networks. So, so those of you who have done machine learning probably have heard about this thing, right? It's like the classical tool that's using computer vision. How does that work is that you have many layers of feature extractor. Like maybe the first one is that we learn to detect edges. 
Then the second one, we learn to hold that, to do a combine the stages to detect maybe textures. Then the third one, we maybe try to first locate these morph some objects and so on and forth, building higher and higher level features, so that I end up maybe by recognizing a whole face or a new one, what we care about. But really think about it as a layered um, feature extractor system. And what we like about these things is first is convolutional. So one of the advantages there is that we do the same processing everywhere. And that's quite important, and so on the network, the idea will be to give for every node, I will do the same. I assume the same process holds everywhere on the network. Again, on the social network example, I will, I will um, I assume that the functions to, that will tell me if I should give uh, some credit, some uh, loan money to somebody or not, will be given by the same function everywhere. What, we, which, which level is this person? Just it will depend on the features from the connections around it. Another thing is that it's localized, so I don't need to, to look at the whole network to predict something about the node. I just need to look okay, at the node in the classical, uh, in the classical ML and maybe one or two holes away. So it just, just stay local. And that's very good for computations, especially if your graph is very large. So what are the difficulties there? So first, like, if you really think about images or time or if it's video, it's three-dimensional, those are including grids, mostly very well arranged set of points in a Euclidean domain in space. Here we can match a filter. Let's say I want to predict something about the middle pixel there. I can just learn a weighted combination of the information on the networks. And every node is the same. For every pixel, I have a node down right and left pixel, which doesn't hold in the graph, right? Maybe you have 100 friends, maybe I have 50. So how do I match them? And even if the, if the, even if the number of Neighbors would be the same. Let's say we all have 50 friends. Then who's friend number one? Who's friend number two? Right? There is no ordering in general. There might be for some networks. If you have lucky you, use it. But in general, we don't. Also, another thing that differs is that usually we have weights. Like I am, the string sheets may have a different strength, right? I may be very close to my family members, and they have some acquaintances where these people are less closer to me. So maybe they are not as good predictors. But still, I want to use this data. So it's not like on pixels. Everybody's the same. It's just one of my neighbors. You just have some neighbors that are more important than others. OK, so some definitions where what I speak about networks or graphs. So we have the nodes, obviously, edges that links those nodes. The edge rate we spoke about before, usually between 0 and 1. 0 is no connection, no edge. 1 would be a very strong connection. And then I have everything in between. And one of the objects that we use a lot in your research is the graph Laplace node. So for those of you that remember some analysis, that's really the Laplace operator on geometries. So it's a differential operator that allows you to compute some things. We'll see, we'll address some examples what, what this operator can do. Another tool that we need is the Fourier transform. So if you remember, if you've done some signal processing or, again, in analysis, like you used to solve the heat equations, you probably have computer this too, at least at school. Uh, so one of the good things about this thing is that it diagonalizes the Laplace operator. So Laplace, in the case the Laplace is a matrix, right? We are in a finite world, or graph has a finite size. So this matrix will have a finite size as well. So what are those three modes? If you look at them, like the, the first one, the first graph, first graph is a grid graph for Latin image, right? Those eigenmodes are vectors that vary little across, uh, that varies across this graph. So the first one is constant, and then we have ones that vary at very little, and they vary more and more and more. The same on another graph. So the, the, the second graph, you can think about it as a sensor network, maybe sensors that measure temperature across a country. Here we cannot place the sensor or who we want, right? It's not a very good, we cannot have a grid on system, right? Maybe a sensor will end up on the building or on the road. It doesn't work. So usually we have sensor anywhere, and then we have to figure out uh, how they work. So now one thing we can do with this Fourier transform first is understand signals. So think about, about think again about the temperature of some sort of talk. I measure temperature there from uh, minus O2 to O2. Okay, that's not a very good temperature, but um, that's a signal, let's say we normalized it. Uh, first one, we see that this is a smooth signal. Temperatures vary very slowly across my network. 
Mais il y a un télécommunication, qui est le télécommunication, mais nettoie comme il n'a pas de paquets pour ce genre de fou que l'on voit. Et ça nous donne des informations sur ce qui se passe là-bas. Donc vous pouvez voir le premier, il est très smooth, donc le data agrée très bien avec le graph. Le graph explique beaucoup de data. Donc il suffit de prendre un exemple social, par exemple, the age is probably a feature that's very smooth on that network, which means that you mostly connect with people of your age. But maybe that's not true, and maybe it looks more like the last one, where ver uh, values vary a lot across nodes. Actually, the last one is completely random. So the sigma does not agree at all uh, with the network, meaning that if I know the network, I cannot tell anything. Just taking an average of the age will be a completely bad predictor. So here, I'm not sure I can use this graph. The graph is not really well suited for this data. But maybe we can do something smart. Okay, so now what do we do with these tools? So we have this graph Fourier transform, <coughs> the Laplacian, and a graph on a signal. So what we do is called filtering. It's an operation to transform signal on graph. So we have my graph, the support of computation, as we already discussed a signal, some data or feature that lives on this graph, like the age, as an input, and then maybe I want to predict something. Like, given the age, I want to predict the revenue, uh, or if I will lend money or not, given multiple signals. And so I need to do a transformation. Of this transformation, we call a filter. Now we can design filters, right? As we did in computer vision back in the day, we designed a filter to detect edges. So here we can design filters to, detect, to do things. So like, that's just an example, right? Input signal, which is high frequency. So that's the, the orange curve. Then I apply this blue filter. It does something, changes the signal, and I get a new signal on the right, which is the, uh, the green curve in the middle. And what does it do? It smooths this thing up. Basically, take a local average. That's an operation I can design. If I want to do a local average, I design this filter, and I apply it to my data, and it will do it. No, so wh why do I want to do that? So whenever, <clears throat> as I said, like we can design filter to do stuff, like to solve the heat equation, to solve wave propagation, or to take local averaging, as we just saw before, maybe to denoise. That's for the temperature and the sensor example. Like maybe I measure temperature everywhere, but my sensors are not very good. They do a lot of mistakes. Or maybe there's snow on one of the sensors and it's pretty bad. What can I do? I can use the information of the other sensors that are around, right? If there's a peak of 10 degrees amongst sensors that are one kilometer away, there's an indication that something's bad. So if I have a good model of what I want to see, plus some noise data, I can combine both to, uh, to do this operation that will clean my data. But for that, I need to know what I want to do. So that's just an example, that's wave propagation. So here I know what I want to do, right? I want to solve wave propagation, I know the PD, the partial differential equation for wave propagation, I can design a filter and that will solve my problem. But sometimes we don't know what we want to do. That's where machine learning enters. So we have a set of input signals, output signals, but no idea of what we should do. Same for in computer vision, when you have to discriminate a cat and a dog, but you don't have a mathematical definition of a cat or a dog. If you would, then you will just uh, design uh, a system that will test your, uh, your definition, right? Like if I, were, if I have to discriminate a circle from a square, that's easy, I have a mathematical definition of that. I can just test that, implement the tested code, run it, and it will discriminate all circles from all squares. But I don't have that for many kind of data, or at least not yet. And even like something I need define, so I will never have it. And that's where machine learning enters. So I won't go much into detail, but basically what we want to do is to say, okay, I have no idea what's the filter I should learn, what's the transformation I should apply, but I have many examples of input output mappings. And I will use that as a way to infer my filter. Okay, so that's one of the operations we saw in the beginning the combination of the network, right? Transformation of data. Another operation that we often have to do is summarization. Because when I transform the data, I extract features. But this grows the size of my data, and now I want to diminish the spatial extent. In no case, number of nodes. So I want to reduce the size of the data. And I want to take a more global view of things. Like if I have a one billion node network, it will be painful to have a global view if I keep this one million node. So maybe I will reduce it. 
There's the two examples, the ear of the sphere, the sphere that can be scooped at the earth, or a point cloud, which is the dark data. Okay, that's show that we can see that as an attention mechanism. Like if I want to predict the emotion on the human face, I don't need to look everywhere. Some parts are much more informative than others, like the ease or the mouth. It's much more predictive than looking at the scalp, right? So I say, yeah, instead of keeping all the data, I will subsample much more on the scalp than on the face. That's the idea of the outer pressure. And we can condition that on the geometry, and so the data, like if the data varies slowly, Missing, maybe there's not much information there, and I saw the task. Like if I want to detect if that guy has E or pulse or clothes, I don't need to look at the mouth, right? Suffices to look at the ease. Okay, so that's the whole thing. So now we get some data, we saw the filtering operation, transforming the data, summarization of the relation that will shrink the whole network. And now we do that many times. Deep learning, right? Multiple layers. We apply these things a lot. And if you want something global, then usually you will have a fully connected layer at the end. But you don't have to. Sometimes you have something local. Like if you want to predict values at nodes, you don't need to take this summarization. OK, so now then this thing, we can apply it to many examples. So as we discussed at the beginning, like there was this global task. Like I give me a world graph with some data, and I say toxic, non toxic. Maybe there's something we want to do with nodes, right? So like that's the example with the point cloud. I have a node, I know its position in space, uh, X, Y, Z, and I know its color, RGB. And now I want to say, okay, that's part of the car, that's part of the, that's part of the road, and that's part of vegetation. That's like very useful for autonomous driving. That's when I care about nodes. Sometimes I also care about, about signals. Maybe I have a network, I have usage statistics of the network, and I want to say, ah, okay, that's normal operations, or that's anomaly. There's something going wrong somewhere. And that's a classification on signal. So I, the network is the same everywhere, but I want to say something about the data is varying, and I want to say something about it. Okay, so here I just add an example of uh, application. I just show this slide. That's the example. So we get the domain is fixed, a graph uh, like which is here mesh or point cloud with RGB data, and I want to output class labels. Okay, I'm skipping the, uh, the, this example. Uh, so what I want to wrap up here, so we can, if we know what we want to do, we can design filters or simulators. If we, if we know the physical process going there, we can design something that will solve it. If we don't, then we need machine learning, at least up until we understand the physical process. And so this has, okay, it's a very new research direction, let's say, it started maybe four, five, four years ago. Now it's, there's a lot of excitations in the machine learning community. And I hope that at some point, network people will maybe be able to use these algorithms for their problems or to contribute their own take on these networks. So thanks for listening. If you have questions, I'm here, or we can also discuss afterwards what you want. Thanks. We have time for a couple of questions. In the meantime, I'd like uh, to uh, invite the panelists, uh, Laurent Imen. Lorenzo and Sam, please uh, join the stage. Um, any questions to Michael? Thank you, Dr. Bach. I have a question about the protein example. Uh, you have the label data that's essentially toxic versus non toxic. So you can't do it. So you can do it. In your example, you have label toxic versus non toxic. For the protein structure, of course, the uh, protein structure is not going to be done. So I'm not an expert at all in protein. Actually, I'm an expert in no kind of data. I just work with networks. They are in the abstract sense. And then, like, to solve these problems, really, I go to people that are experts in the domain, and they provide, like, those kind of, because, yeah, I cannot answer this question. I have no idea what's wrong. So, just to add, actually, the same example. So, uh, when you work with, like, the image classification and you have a move on your analysis, uh, since at a certain point after the, uh, the convolutional and the mass pooling or downsampling, as you call it, you have fully convolutional layers, um, basically you have some constraints on the initial uh, shape of the image. So, like image classifiers are, are always of the same shape. And uh, so, my question is I guess that for the same example that you mentioned, so proteins, in general, I would maybe be interested in uh, trying to understand whether just from the structure.
structure without even looking at the features that actually know, but just looking at the pattern of the activity uh, that corresponds to something that is good protein, say, or bad protein. Or like, is it possible for uh, to build a classifier that accepts, therefore, graphs that have different connectivity pattern, or you have similar constraints as for image classification? You can. Actually, even for image classification, the fixed size requirement is not due to the convolutions. It's due to the fully connected layers. Because convolutions, they are local, and they are invariant to positions. So I can compute the convolution on each pixel of the image independently, wherever they are, wherever how many I am. But the graph is the same. For each node, I can compute a transformation independently. And actually, usually, like on very large graphs, like the point cloud, they have one billion nodes, if I do a computation on one side of the city and on the other side, I want, let's say, to, to do a semantic segmentation, I just need to look at the largest object I care about. Maybe it's just a car. So I don't need to look at the full graph, right? So I don't even care what's behind my horizon, right? So the recent film is that um, upper bounded by the size of the object you care about. So all the operations are local. Which means that, indeed, I can compute on any graph of different size. Then, if you want to do something global, like toxic, non-toxic, at some point you need to summarize. So you need to take an operation that is invariant to the number of nodes, or the number of pixels. And these operations, if you need to do that, then you cannot take a fully connected network, right? Because these expect a fixed size input. So either when you person, you do something a bit dynamic so that you end up with a graph of a fixed size, let's say in the nodes, and then you can fill that with something. But there you end up again, like, what happens if I, if I permute, right? So usually what we do, or what people do in the community, is that they take one of these functions that is invariant to the number of inputs. It's like, for example, the easiest one is the average. It's called global average. So people just take the value at all the nodes, all the pixels, average that out, and then they, they use that as a prediction. So it's like you predict toxicity for each node, and then you average that to get a global prediction. And actually, your recipe fee field is sufficiently large, maybe, because if you want to do something global, you want the recipe field to be global. So at the last layer, maybe the prediction, the value on one node is already an aggregation of everything on the, on the, on the network, because it has seen everything up across the whole layers. That's usually what this is sort But it works for images as well, right? Yes? Sure, maybe. Yeah, I don't. You, you have nothing. You are trying to break the same exactly the same one. Are you looking at the attention of the network to change how you do? So, for instance, for the protein example, it's the binding attention. Absolutely. The, how the entire shape. Yeah, attention is definitely another way to solve this kind of problem. Yeah. You say I have a budget. Let's say I have hundred points of attention. Yeah. Place them where it matters. And that's the way, uh, that's one way of fixing uh, this problem of our size. Yeah. And that's what we do for pulling. Yes, last question. Very interesting approach. Um, for um, mapping the convolutions, I kind of understand because it's a bit intuitive, but what do you feel about the role of recurrence? I mean, it's along the lines of that question. Like, kind of memory or attention, or in other words, long distance dependencies and embedding them into the graphs to see it from that perspective. So you long distance, like if you have dependencies across the world yes. graph, right? Yeah. So either you take large filters, like filters that look uh, number of nodes away, like maybe 100 nodes away. Either you take a lot of layers, that grows exponentially, right? If I, uh, if I look two nodes away and I do 10 layers, it's 2 to the 10, which is already quite a lot. You can do deleted convolutions as well. That's what people do on uh, computer vision. And the other one, obviously, is cursory, reducing the size of the graph. So those three approaches together are able to, to deal with long distance dependencies. You're welcome, thank you. Okay, thanks.